And too often the wrong people are attracted to power. Those are the people we describe as power hungry. 나쁜 권력자는 감시하고 최고의 사람을 권좌에 올리는 방법. 브라이언 클라스에게 들어봅니다. Welcome to EBS. w i d i h a n Suap. Great minds. My name is Brian Kloss. I'm an associate professor in global politics at University College London. I study power, or as I like to say it, often I study bad people who do bad things. And so I'm going to talk to you about how power works, how systems of power can be reformed, and how we can end up with the best people among our societies at the very, very top. Now, when you think about power and how it operates, there are a couple different hypotheses that tend to be banded about for how it works. And the most common one is this, that power corrupts. Now, that is derived from a quote from a man named Lord Acton in history. And what he meant was that good, decent people who end up in power, power corrodes them. It turns them worse. It makes them behave badly. And so that's hypothesis one, that you take a good person, you put them in power, and what's spit out at the end is someone behaving badly, abusing people, abusing their power. Now, hypothesis two is completely the opposite of that. It's that power attracts corruptible people, that power acts like a magnet to the worst among us, that power acts like a magnet to people who are power hungry, right? That phrase power hungry means someone who wants power. And of course, someone who wants power is probably more likely to end up getting it. So the question is, which of these is more accurate? Is it that power corrupts or is it that power attra attracts the corruptible? That's the most important question because, of course, the powerful people among us are the ones who make decisions, whether it's in politics or business, even in sports, is by thinking that every single group of humans is a non-random subset of the population. Now, what I mean by that is that every single time that you put people together, there are skews in who shows up to that group. So if you think about a basketball tryout, for example, or a baseball tryout, What you're going to have in the baseball tryout, tryout is a series of people who are much more athletic on average than the rest of the population. With a basketball tryout, you're going to have people show up who are much taller on average than the rest of the population. So every single time that you put humans together in groups, there is a skew, what's called self-selection bias. Tall people self-select into basketball tryouts, more athletic people who are good at baseball self-select into baseball tryouts. The reason that matters for power is because power is the ultimate self-selection, right? It is a group of people who think to themselves, I should be in charge. Now that is a non-random set of the population, right? Most people do not think that. If you think about who's going to be the president of the United States, for example, most people in America do not think that they should be in charge. A very small subset of the population does, right? This is the other thing that's really, really important to understand, is that the group of people who self-selects into power is abnormal. They're weird. Not necessarily in a bad way, they're just unusual. And they're unusual with a series of traits that we're going to talk about in this series, like psychopathy, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and a series of other traits about being power hungry that tend to manifest themselves in systems of power. So the question then becomes, who seeks power in the first place? And that's actually a very difficult question to answer. So we have to sort of tackle it in a few different ways. Now, any time that you get a very simple, straightforward genetic uh, response or explanation for a very complex social dynamic, you should be skeptical because the world is not so simple. And actually, when you think about the leadership gene, it may be that it is tied to people who seek power, but more likely it's actually tied to traits that make you better at getting power. So people who are outgoing, extroverted, charming, likable, potentially even attractive, right? These traits can all be tied to power obtaining, not necessarily power seeking. So we can't necessarily disaggregate between which one is seeking and which one is good for obtaining. Now, all of this is to say that we don't really know. We don't have a clear answer to who seeks power. But we do know that there are good measures that we can use in psychology analysis to try to determine this. And there's a few different metrics that have been used through history, uh, modern history, to try to track this. 
One of them, for example, is called NPOW, or need for power. And psychologists try to measure this need for power in, in people, and they find that humanity exists on a spectrum. Some people score extremely high on this trait, some people not so much. They couldn't be bothered. They don't really care if they end up in charge, whereas other people are obsessed with power. They need it, they crave it, and they want dominance over others. There's another uh, trait that's sometimes measured called social dominance orientation, or SDO. Another way of measuring it, and this tends to be correlated with people who want to control other people. So, so social dominance orientation sometimes shows up very, very young in people who are bullies, for example. Um, they want to control others, they want to assert their power, and sometimes it shows up in quite destructive ways. Now, on top of this, you have to think about how systems attract certain people to power. And this is something that's very, very important to understand because as we'll see in this series, it's not just that power corrupts, it's that systems mediate who shows up for self-selection bias. So in my own work, when I've tried to think about who seeks power, what I decided to do is I decided to travel around the world and study people who are powerful. And that meant I went around everywhere from Madagascar to Thailand to Zambia and Belarus, the United States, everywhere you can think of to talk to powerful people, people who were business leaders, people who were sometimes corrupt, sometimes people who were former despots or dictators, and occasionally people who had done some really, really awful things, people who had ordered torture, who were involved in coup plots to overthrow governments, or had been in, in rebel armies and had killed people. And what was really interesting in this research was that I found that these people were extremely unusual extremely different from the average person in society. And what I found really jarring in particular is that they were overwhelmingly charming. They were overwhelmingly likable. Where they gave children uh, pictures of faces. And they said to these children, we want you to look at these faces and we want you to decide between the two options who looks like the person who should be in charge of your imaginary ship. But the only information the children was, were given was faces, right? Just two pictures side by side. Now, the kids did not know that the faces that they were given, one of them was the winner of a recent election in Europe, and the other one was the runner-up in that election, right? So the person who won the election and the person who came in second. And yet, despite not having any information to go on, systematically the kids picked the winner as the person to champion their ship, to captain their ship. In other words, they were able to discern from faces alone who looked like a leader, and that matched up very, very closely with who voters actually chose to be their leader. Now, this is important to understand because we often like to think of power as being allocated for rational reasons, right? We give power to people who are competent, good, decent, wise, etc. In fact, what this study is showing us is that very often we're making extremely superficial judgments about who looks like a leader to us. Now, that's particularly problematic in modern society where we have all these biases of things like racism and sexism because throughout modern history, the people who have looked powerful are overwhelmingly in Western societies, for example, white men. So when the studies have been done in Western societies, what they've found is that the correlation between those who look powerful and demographic biases of those who were powerful in the past is very, very strongly overlapping. Now this tells us that we need to think carefully about how to represent people in power to attract those who are systematically out of power in modern life. And what I mean by that is if you think about yourself as someone who might want to seek and obtain power in the future. You might look up in society and you might see people who look quite unlike you, right? A, a lot of modern societies, for example, are dominated by men in power. So if you're a, a, a woman, a young woman who's thinking, I want to become powerful and you look up in society and you see a series of men, that creates a systematic bias, sometimes uh, subconsciously even, which causes some people to think, I don't belong in this group, right? 
It's a really sad statement on our, our, our modern societies that it's like this, but it does have a systematic effect. And on top of that, when it comes to allocating power, people subconsciously, sometimes consciously, also operate on these biases. So if you put these things together, we have social dynamics that systematically bias certain types of people into getting power. But even before that, we have these biases within us, sometimes personality traits, sometimes power-hungry characteristics, the need for power, social dominance orientation, that cause some people to seek power more in the first place. And as a result of that, we have this culling process, right? And so what I think about is that all of us look at power and we make a major mistake. We look at powerful people and we say, wow, they're all awful. Why do we end up with these people in charge? And then we condemn the individual and we replace them with somebody else and we end up repeating history. We end up with another person in charge who is corrupt or abuses their power or makes mistakes in leadership. And we wonder why this cycle persists. Why do we keep on getting the same bad leaders? And the answer I suggest is because our systems are broken. And our systems are broken because our mechanisms of power attract the wrong people, promote them into positions of power based on whether they're good at getting power rather than whether they're good at wielding power, and then allows them to stay in power much longer than they should. So if we're going to fix this problem, if we're going to reform power and make it better for us, if we're going to be the first generation in history to solve the problem that perplexed and baffled humans since the Roman and ancient Greeks and Egyptian times, well, then we have to think smarter. And to do that, we have to fundamentally reform how power operates so it attracts and promotes and maintains people who are the best among us rather than too often the worst.